Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Hildebrandt and Dr. Wagner uh, talking to us about hearing loss. So uh, Dr. Hildebrandt graduated with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Biology from Bloomsburg University and then earned her Doctor of Audiology from, also from Bloomsburg University. She offers experience in comprehensive audiometric testing for all ages, uh, auditory brainstem response testing, balance testing, and hearing aid treatment uh, options. Her philosophy is a clinical approach to hearing healthcare that is based on research and centers on uh, assessing, wow, I can't read, <laughs> assessing the individual needs of, of patients. Um, Dr. Wagner graduated with a Bachelor's of Science degree from, in Communicative Disorders and subsequently a Doctor of Audiology from uh, Northern Illinois University. Before joining the audiology team at St. Luke's, she practiced at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Dr. Wagner is passionate about providing excellent family-centered care to all her patients, and her clinical interests include pediatrics, vestibular, and electrophysiology. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Hildebrandt, who is right there, and Dr. Wagner. So good afternoon everyone, I'm Dr. Wagner, uh, Jessica, please. Um, so today our topic is hearing healthcare and you. <coughs> Go ahead. Okay. So um, this next this is our designation statement. Um, to be honest, it was just given to us, so I really have no idea what it says, but I think it's because we're legally bound to six weeks. Yep. Um, the next one is, of course, our financial. Um, we are not um, disclosed, so there's nothing we're not getting paid for this. Um, so our next one, so our learning objective. So um, at the end of today, we're hoping we can have you describe at least three ways hearing loss can impact the quality of life. Um, and we're hoping that, given a case example of an elderly patient with hearing loss, uh, if you'll be able to refer them um, to the most appropriate provider. <laughs> so first, I want to start off as what is an audiologist? So who are we? So uh, first off, it does take us eight total years. So seven of which is academic work, and one year is clinical externship. Um, seven of those, four is undergrad, so don't get too excited. Um, you will see some credentials after our, our name. So the first one is most commonly is the CCCA. So this is brought by the American Speech and Language Hearing Association, or ASHA. Um, this is a professional scientific and credentialing association for speech language pathologists and audiologists. Um, this allows us audiologists <laughs> to see students. So some schools will not allow their students to see um, any provider who doesn't have their seats. So uh, kind of a controversy in our, in our field. The next one is the FAAA. It's a fellow American Academy of Audiology. So this group is uh, made by and for the audiologists. Um, so speech has nothing to do with them. And then finally, that ABA. So this is an autonomous organization. Um, it allows for audiologists to be board certified. Um, it's only in limited areas. So it's pediatrics and cochlear implants. Um, board certification with audiology doesn't mean you're better than any of us regulars who don't have it. It just means you took a quiz and you paid extra money to get it. Um, and of course, all importantly, we are all state licensed. So what is our scope of practice? Um, when people ask me what an audiologist is, I would say I'm a hearing imbalance doctor. Um, so that being said, yes, we do the diagnostic audiological testing for infants and adults. Um, we do fit hearing aids and cochlear implants or um, bone anchored hearing aids. But we also do vestibular testing. We um, assess them, we test them, we can do the rehabilitation. Um, we also do electrophysiology assessment. So electrophys is more of those sedated versions of hearing tests, so ABRs and ASSRs. Um, this is more for our kids who, or adults who can't test regularly in our clinic itself. Um, if you're big into research, you will see a lot of research in P300s and uh, MLRs, middle latency response. This is all electrophys. Um, we also do facial nerve monitoring. So this is done with what we call an ENOG. Um, it's an electro neuro neurography. Um, and this just tests the, the facial nerve integrity. So this actually comes into surgeons um, that if there needs to be intervention uh, needed. And then of course we do intraoperative monitoring. I will say this is a scope within our scope. Um, in order to do this intraoperative monitoring, you actually have to have a certificate 
um, that's done by certain universities with it, but most likely it's the audiologist doing that. So I do want to touch on some facts. So at the age of 75, one out of three individuals do have a hearing loss. The hearing loss is actually the second most prevalent global health issue. Uh, for individuals older than 60 years, that risk of dementia um, is actually related closely to the severity of their hearing loss. <coughs> the prevalence of dementia is projected to double every 20 years. So if we do the math, so by 2050, we'll have more than 100 million people. So that's nearly one in 85 uh, persons who would be affected worldwide, which is kind of scary. In 2018, an estimated 5.7 million Americans of all ages had Alzheimer's. And every 65 seconds, someone is actually um, diagnosed or developed with a disease. So how do we hear? So making it simple, we hear the sounds with our ears. That our, our ears just simply catch the sounds, and it actually sends it up to our brain. Our brain is actually where we perceive that information. So we'll be, our, our brain will tell us, is it speech? Is it music? Is it noise? Um, and Brittany is actually going to go in a little bit more detail about these. Um, so. All right, hi guys. I apologize, I'm a little sick, so just bear with me here. Um, all right, so this may be review for you guys. Some of it may be new, uh, but this is our ear. It's broken into three parts. So we have our outer ear, our outer ear, which is our pinna, as just mentioned, it is the part that collects the sound and then transmits it through the outer ear, uh, which is where it will then meet our tympanic membrane, our eardrum. It will then vibrate our three ossicles, so the three smallest bones in the body of your malleus, your anchors, and your stapes. And then the snail shell back here, that's your cochlea, that's your hearing organ. Um, so what happens is the tympanic membrane actually vibrates in response to sound, moves those ossicles, those bones, and it actually displaces fluid throughout the cochlea. That fluid displacement is in a wave-like fashion, and what it does is it creates small electrical responses, which are then transmitted up the auditory nerve into the brain, which is where we then not only detect sound, but make it something meaningful, so speech, music, something like that. So when you come to see us, the first thing that we're going to do is otoscopy. So we're going to look in your ears, make sure there's no wax, no foreign bodies, uh, make sure you have clear, healthy ears. <coughs> then we're going to do a test called tympanometry. It's a very quick test. What we're doing is just putting a probe tip in your ear, applying a small amount of pressure, making sure that your eardrum is moving back and forth and that there's nothing uh, preventing it from doing so. So these are common tympanograms. Um, so as you can see, Normal would be our type A right here. So we are looking for a nice little mountain peak, which is allowing our eardrum to move back and forth in response to that pressure. Occasionally, we will see this flat line here, type B. That's usually in indicating that there's something going on behind that eardrum, um, usually uh, middle ear infection. So a lot of fluid going on, preventing that eardrum from moving back and forth. So once we've done the last tympanometry, we have clear, healthy ears. What do we do next? We're going to put you in the booth. First, we're going to start out with speech testing. We do this two ways. We have our speech recognition threshold and our word recognition score, and I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Uh, we first start off with our pure tone testing, our air testing. Uh, so we will either use our inserts or headphones, and this is actually using the whole ear as a system. Um, when we do testing this way, this is where we get our X's and our O's and plot your thresholds. Your threshold is the softest sound that you can respond to twice. And then that's what we mark on our, our audiogram. Next, we're going to do bone conduction. So bone conduction is actually bypassing the middle, the outer and the middle ear, and simply testing the hearing organ on its own. Um, this is what actually gives us our type of hearing, so whether it be sensory neural conductive or mixed. This little box right here is our bone conduction. Um, it actually sits right on your mastoid, and again, simply tests your hearing organ alone. So why do we test speech and why it's important? So it is important for us to know the softest sounds, pitches or frequencies that you're able to respond to, but more importantly, we wanna know what your brain is still capable of understanding. So when talking about hearing, there's always two parts. Did I hear it and did I understand it? Um, so we, again, wanna make sure that the brain is not only able to detect sound, but make it something meaningful, understand uh, speech. So, as I mentioned, we have our SRT, our speech recognition threshold. This is your ability to repeat a two-syllable phonetically balanced word, such as baseball, cowboy, hot dog. Uh, once we obtain that threshold, we're going to then present a list of 25 everyday words at 35 decibels. Again, that's how we measure sound above your SRT. So, for example, if you have a 20 dB uh, SRT, we're going to present our 25 words at 55 decibels. We have our percent score, which again is going to give us 
how well are you understanding, how well is your brain able to understand and make sense of what it's getting. So when you come to see us, this is our audiogram. This is what you will get when you're done seeing us. It contains all the information. So over here we have our tympanometry, how well your eardrums are moving and how healthy your ears are. Down here we have our speech information, so your SRT and your WRS score. And then up here is where we're going to plot your hearing loss. So when we're talking about hearing loss, we classify it three ways, degree, configuration, and type. So an example of that is mild, sloping to severe sensorineural hearing loss. And I'm going to kind of get into that. So and when we look at our uh, audiogram, which is again this graph here, when we go from top to bottom, we're looking at volume. So we start off with zero decibels, which is very soft, like a whisper. And as we move down, we're getting to very loud. Um, so again, down here at 120, we're talking about a jet plane taking off. We have normal hearing, um, you know, zero to 25 for adults, and then different degrees of hearing loss. Um, and if you look over here, this is what we call our speech banana. And this is showing all of the important speech sounds and where they're located on the audiogram. It also has uh, common everyday sounds that you would hear uh, in your daily life. So again, when we're talking about our audiogram in the graph, when we go from the left to the right, we're looking at pitch. So if you think of a piano keyboard, on the left-hand side, we have our low bassy pitches. And as we move over, we have our higher squeakier pitches. Now, what that means for speech and language, if you look over here at our speech banana, in the low pitches is where we find most of our vowels, which is what gives our voice its volume. And then in the higher pitch sounds is where we find our consonants, which is what gives us clarity and understanding. So again, did I hear it and did I understand it? So these are different types of hearing configurations that we can see. Uh, they can range, uh, but these are the most common. Uh, so if we have a flat hearing loss, which just means that our thresholds are within 10, D, 10 decibels of each other. More commonly, we'll see a sloping hearing loss. And this is one of the reasons why we don't like to use percent of hearing loss, because more than likely, a person does not have the same hearing loss across the board. Um, more likely, it's in a sloping fashion. So if I were to pick this one and say, oh, they have 40% hearing loss, well, that's not truly accurate, because they're hearing better over here and worse over here. That's why we go with the degree of hearing loss. So this would be a mild to moderate hearing loss. And again, we have all different types of configurations. We have a precipitous loss, which just means we have a very, very steep drop. Um, rising, this is very common in cardiovascular issues or high fevers. Next, we have a trough or cookie bite. And then lastly, a notch. So a notch is very common um, for noise exposure. So uh, as you can see here, we have a notch at 4,000 hertz. That's very commonly seen in hunters that do not wear hearing protection. We can also sometimes see a notch at 2,000 hertz, which is usually indicating uh, otosclerosis, which is a condition of the ear that does cause hearing loss. So as I mentioned, there are three things that we use to classify hearing loss. The last one we're going to talk about is type. So we have sensory normal hearing loss, which is very common. Uh, it involves the cochlea and the eighth cranial nerve. It is a permanent hearing loss, and it simply means that your air conduction, so again, when we use the whole ear as a system, the X's and the O's, and then that bone conduction, the part that goes behind the ear, everything's lining up in a nice, neat line. Next, we have a conductive hearing loss. This usually involves a disorder of the middle ear or outer ear, so for example, including wax, preventing the sound from going through the system, or middle ear effusion, uh, auto. Uh, of Chinese media uh, with uh, fluid in the ears. Um, so again, when we test the ear as a whole system, we get our X's and our O's down here with the hearing loss. But then when we test the bone and take that part out, the middle and the outer ear, we have nice normal bone responses. So the idea is that this is a temporary hearing loss. So if we can resolve that outer or middle ear issue, these thresholds more than likely will jump back up into that normal range. Lastly, we have a mixed hearing loss. This is a combination of conductive and sensory neural. More than likely, the person has a hearing loss, but also has something else on top of it, like a middle ear uh, disorder or occluding wax, which means we have more hearing loss than normal. And again, it means that our bone scores are falling out of that normal range. Uh, occasionally, if we can clear up that middle or outer ear um, issue, these thresholds will again jump back up to where this bone uh, score is. But again, we're still looking at a hearing loss. Ooh, sorry. So this is an example of hearing loss that goes untreated for an extended period of time. 
So we have a regular hearing loss, or not regular, but a, a typical hearing loss. So we have a moderate sloping to severe. Um, we have our SRT down here, as you can see, 40, which lines up with our pure tone average, which, just, which is just the average threshold that 5, 1, and 2. But when we asked the person to repeat the words, the 25 words, we raised our voices to a level of 75, so nice and loud. Um, all of our thresholds are above it. But they were only able to understand 56% of the words in the right ear and 48% of the words in the left ear. So this, again, is an example of your ability to understand speech, no matter how clear it is. So again, we want to look at our WRS, our, our word recognition scores, to know what the brain is still capable of understanding, even when it's being given that volume that it's missing naturally. So we do this for a couple of reasons. Again, um, we want to know what the brain is capable of understanding, and it'll also let us know how well someone will do with hearing aids. So at best, with hearing aids, this person is still only going to be able to understand 50% of the words that are said to them. Um, so again, this is where it comes into play. We, you know, we want to prevent this, um, and we do that by wearing hearing aids. But if it takes, on average, as Jeff mentioned, on average, seven years for somebody to do something, we very frequently see that a person has uh, decreased understanding. Um, so I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Jess. She's gonna talk to you about what we do once we find hearing loss in this. Okay, I trust you. All right, so you have a hearing loss, now what? So there's a couple of things I'm just gonna kinda of touch on. So uh, one thing, hearing aids, and I will go into a little bit more detail about them. Um, another thing out there is assistive listening devices. Um, implantable devices, I'm not gonna go into detail on these, but the, uh, to know they're out there, so bone anchor hearing aids and cochlear implants, they are a whole separate entity in their candidacy, so it does, um, would stem basically based off of the audiogram that we would get. Um, do you do nothing? Or, of course, the ever so common, hey, I got this in the mail yesterday, where can I go for these? Um, so, you know, the big takeaway of this is once a person starts losing hearing, they, they wait on average about seven years to seek that help, like Brittany said. So that it, it is a little concerning. So now we're seeing these people seven years after that problem most likely started to occur, or even longer than that. So I want to touch on the, I brought, I, hey, I got this in the mail. So there's two things out there that you may see in the media, in the um, your magazines and whatnot, um, and one of the big ones is called the over-the-counter hearing aids. Um, so first off, the FDA has until August of 2020 to even write guidelines for this. So there's really legally no FDA-approved over-the-counter hearing aids out there. So if the patient says they got this over-the-counter, uh-oh. Um, the hearing test is actually completed uh, by the patients themselves. Um, that's kind of scary because they're most likely doing it in their living room and there's distractors going on and it's not done completely the proper way. Um, so there also leads to that whole there's no medical follow-up. As Brittany said, there's different types of hearing loss that warrant some what we call a ear, nose, and throat intervention coming in. Um, they are only approved for mild to moderate hearing loss. Um, as Brittany said, there's multiple different hearing losses. It's not just mild to moderate. They do come with factory presets for their hearing aids. So as audiologists, presets are great. However, we use prescriptive targets. So prescriptive targets, um, there's scientific uh, research behind these targets. And we actually put our hearing aids in what we call an electroacoustic box, and we run these in them um, on the patient and, of course, in the box, and kids can't sit still. Um, and this makes sure that the hearing aids aren't over-amplified, and then they're not under-amplified. So it is, becomes more of a, a safety thing. Which kind of leads me to the ability of patients to manipulate their hearing aids on their own via an app. So again, safety. So um, patients are taking this app and they're just kind of playing around with their volume and can actually cause damage to their hearing. Um, my dad is 75 and barely knows how to check his email. So this worries me that this is out there. Um, and they use Skype for assistance. I'm probably <laughs> one of the, the professions out there who does not like telehealth. Um, I need to see my patient, I need to help you, um, I need to look in your ears, I need to see your hearing aid in my hand, and I need to take it and actually do things with it. I can't do that with a screen in front of me. So um, that makes me nervous in terms of the type of care they are going to get that way. Which then leads us to the big box. This is what you do see if you are a Costco member, BJ's, um, what's the other ones out there? Sam's, Sam's Club. Club. Yeah. So there's, first off, there's a wide variation of training experience. So as I said in that first slide, we are eight years of graduate school, or eight, four and four, so eight total. A hearing instrument specialist or a hearing aid tech, it is the same thing. Specialist doesn't make them any smarter. 
what they do is they graduate college or uh, high school with a diploma, they read a book, they take a test, and they have a license to dispense. That's a huge difference in education with that versus us. Um, so this is someone who I have heard this horror story, uh, wanted a promotion from tires, the tire department, and they offered him money to go do this, and now he's dispensing hearing aids. Yes, that's out there. Um, hearing aids offered are actually below the economy level and contain older technology. So yes, you're right, they are cheaper. But again, very low technology and very old technology. There is no loaner hearing aids offered. So if something goes wrong with it, you're kind of out of luck. <laughs> that being said, they have limited repair options. Um, I looked more into this research and it, it actually shows that some of these big box companies, they actually have a contract where if a hearing aid's broken, they actually have to send it to the company. They cannot fix it in-house. Um, come to us, we try and do the best we can to fix it because we don't want to send you home without anything on your ears. Um, the store actually owns their hearing test. They are actually not allowed to leave with it and go elsewhere with it. Us, we don't want you to, but you can. Um, there is no insurance benefits. So even if your insurance does, which is very, very limited, I apologize, it's not our fault, but we're trying to make a big impact. Um, but if you do have one, they will not honor it. Uh, limited care, so again, they only do hearing aids, nothing else. Um, there's no pre-scheduled routine follow-up. So everywhere that I have gone, um, every time we fit someone with a hearing aid, we wanna see them a couple weeks after, check in, make sure everything's okay. They're kind of the whole, here you go, see you in 30 days, or come back if you have a problem. That's not, that's not good. We want to make sure that you're coping okay and the sound is okay for you. Um, the other thing is, it's, they're busy. It's a first come, first serve. It, they, they don't care if they don't see you. Us, it eats on us. We want to see, we will fit you in, we will not take lunch, we will stay later um, to make sure you're taken care of. So, so the next is the different types of care needs. So, Again, um, these big box in the over-counter are strictly a certain type. So when you come to us, there are different variants of hearing aid styles. And you may have seen all of these on everyone, or you may have a family member who has one. Um, so they do come in different styles, which is based off of the appropriateness of their, their audio. Um, I will say this is where uh, miracle ear and that come into play. They commonly only uh, fit a certain style, which is not most, most often is not appropriate. So um, it's a big thing to, to have an audiologist look and see what is more appropriate. Um, they do vary in different prices. They do. And that all depends on the technology within the box that sits behind your ear. So am I going to offer a top tier $5,000 hearing aid, a pair of hearing aids to someone who's just sitting at home and goes out to breakfast every, every now and then? No. So we base it off of, you know, what is your lifestyle? Tell me what you do on a daily basis. And we kind of go from there. We talk prices with them. Um, they're not corrective. They're called aids for a reason. They help us. They're not like our, gla our glasses where um, hopefully you get 2020, not me. Um, and then of course it, it helps with the collection of data. So this is where we're going to talk a little bit more in, in the road here about um, the importance of, of amplifying these hearing, hearing losses um, because they do help take the data that we hear in our everyday world and send it to our brain. So some realistic expectations, and this kind of goes to, to all of us. Um, so first off, yes, the patient, when they have a hearing aid, you are going to hear everything around you. Yes, dishes are loud. Yes, the person sitting next to you talks loud. Yes, when you pee, it is loud. But guess what? It's loud for everybody. And my big counseling tool on this is the more you wear your hearing aid, the more your brain will adapt and will get used to it and will learn to tune that stuff out. Um, so it is a big learning curve. And it's more of that, that realistic expectation of the person in front of you. So do I expect a kid who is just diagnosed with a hearing aid or a hearing loss to wear his hearing aid from morning till night? No. Realistically, it's not going to happen right off the bat. <clears throat> Ideally, in the end, I'd love that. But my, my goals are, you know, let's school first and then let's work, build it up after, after school. Same thing with adults. Sometimes it's overwhelming at first. So little by little. And again, we don't send you out full blast. This is where that critical care comes into play of making sure you're comfortable and this is okay for you. And we kind of work at your pace. Um, there is cleaning and there is bi-weekly uh, of battery changes. Granted, they've come a long way. There's rechargeability, so you don't have to, to worry about a little, little battery. Um, that I feel is great for, for especially infants um, and our older generation with dexterity issues. Um, it's great for those techies who just don't want to deal with battery and just in and out. 
Um, the cleaning has come a long way too. It's not as, as hard as it used to be. Um, and that's something we review and make sure the patient can do it independently or if they're in a home that someone's with them so we can show them how to do it themselves. Um, and the big thing about this is the, the strategy. So you know, just because you have hearing aids, you do not have bionic hearing. They are not going to hear you down the hall to the left downstairs. It's not going to happen. Um, so it's big to be in the same room, grab their attention, let them see your face. Um, you know, we don't realize we do it, but we do watch lips when we talk. Um, and that's something that, that that's huge for someone who can't hear. Um, rephrasing, not necessarily re repeating. Again, they didn't hear you. So if they didn't hear you the first time, try it a little differently. Rephrase it. See if they get it. Um, and of course, limit the amount of background noise you can. Um, that's always going to help anybody, especially even normal hearing. It's going to help you. <laughs> so a little bit more about effective communication strategies. So again, must be face-to-face. Clear and precise. This is the big one. So we all counsel our patients. Some may be hard of hearing or we may just have a lot of noise in the background. Um, the best thing I use for this one, so part of that speech understanding, um, we do live voice. So when I do this, I am a little bit more conscious. So one of the words is stove. So I'm just sitting here saying, yes, I put the pot on the stove. When I'm testing them, I'm actually taking that extra effort and I'm saying stove. I'm actually emphasizing that V because that's going to make a big difference for someone who's not looking at me and is trying to hear what I'm saying. So when they're looking at you, adding that extra enunciation is going to help them tremendously. Um, you know, pause after a point. Make sure they understood what you were saying. Sometimes I used to have them, so, you know, can you rephrase what I said? Let me make sure that you understood it because the last thing I want them to do is go home and forget everything I said. Um, and just talk to them. I mean, it, it, you don't have to scream, you don't have to shout, There's, you don't have to do that, just grab their attention, that's the big thing. Um, touch and gesture, this is more for, for the family members. Um, you know, grabbing the husband or, or wife's attention before they start speaking. Uh, the most common thing I hear is, well, <laughs> she's in the, the kitchen washing the dishes, holding a conversation, and expects me to hear it. Yeah, I don't expect you to. So it's a lot of simple, simple things. Um, we all don't do this, and I preach it, and I still don't practice everything I preach, but I'm trying. So as long as we try, that, that's better than, than not. So back to the, the smartness of the hearing aids, it, it's improving. So it's not like our, our old on and pops hearing aids where we had to use a, um, a screwdriver to change the volume or whatnot. Everything is, is electrical, and digital, and, and super smart, sometimes freakishly smart. Um, it now has the ability to stream, which is huge for people who have difficulty on the phone. So now I'm giving someone the benefit of not just using one ear, but two ears. So that phone call is going to stream to both ears. Um, and that's huge. That, make, that makes a big impact on someone who's trying just to, to have a conversation with, with their daughter or, or son. Um, the sooner you help the hearing, the sooner your overall health will improve. A, a little bit on the assistive listening devices. I'm not going to go into it big, but just want to show you that these are out there. So in those rare cases, someone can afford these things. There are hearing aids. There are other options that are, are cheaper. So more comes into the um, amplified telephones. Uh, my big one is a, a bed shaker. So it'll actually, it, it's an alarm clock. So for someone who cannot hear, even when they're sleeping without their hearing aids or with hearing aids, um, it'll wake them up. So it's more of a safety thing. They also have a smoke alarm that actually flashes a certain frequency of light um, that can wake you from your sleep, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but the big one in terms of, of us medical professions, you know, there are stethoscopes out there that do work with your hearing aids um, and they can amplify it. So um, it doesn't limit you from your job, from taking blood pressure or listening to the heartbeat that there are things out there. So what if we do nothing? Well, again, we don't hear with our ears, we hear with our brain. So if we don't hear with our brain, then we're not understanding what's going on. Um, and this is kind of leading me into these different researches. So throughout our research, we actually found um, a couple of links for cognitive decline. And there's four theories we stumbled on and really couldn't ignore about this. Um, so I do want to go through these. I'm going to discuss two, and then Brittany will take it away. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is called the cascade. Um, so with this cascade, it pretty much, um, what they did was human studies have pretty much found that elderly individuals with hearing loss um, have a decreased volumes in their prim uh, 
uh, auditory cortex and their total brain volume. Um, following this, another researcher actually capitalized on it and used uh, functional MRIs and uh, just wanted to see that the link or the relationship <laughs> between the hearing um, ability and the cortical brain volume itself. They actually did find um, a significant linear relationship between the hearing ability and the gray matter volume of the primary auditory cortex. Um, so this actually suggested that the modulations of neural activity related to our, our hearing loss um, actually appears to impact those resources to perform these higher level cognitive operations, um, which support this whole theory of a relocation or resource allocation framework. Um, which I want to go to the next slide. It's going to talk about the use it or lose it. And this is something we do, at least I do, uh, talk with my patients about. So the use it or lose it, what happens is our brains, we're, there's neuroplasticity and it's experience dependent. So over time, it has the ability to change. So in fact, if it's the brain is not using it, it's going to simply lose that function and it's going to find another function to put that spot to. So with the use it or lose it, that's what we're, we're kind of seeing that, hey, if we have the degraded input from the peripheral um, hearing, that we're also going to have now the decrease in the nerve activity of the auditory pathway because it's not being stimulated. Um, so pretty much if one doesn't use it for their hearing, they're going to lose it, which leads us to almost a, what we call a two-hit model. And I'm going to go more in detail about the two-hit. So it, it does exist in the brain. And it, it leads to less severe latent hearing <laughs> pathology. So what that means is it's the first hit. So and this is mainly due to other causes, which leads us to a different hypothesis. But on this image, I just kind of want to show you. Um, there's detriments that are related to hearing loss directly and indirectly with this. So that indirectly is through the changing of the brain's plasticity and whatnot. Um, the hearing loss directly is showing that we have that de decrease in the verbal communication failure, um, you know, socialization goes away, that leads to depression and ap um, apathy, and of course social isolation, which then leads to that cognitive impairment. No. <laughs> now, I was saying that common cause one. So, the common cause, essentially, this is pretty much that, that both hearing loss and cognitive impairment are the result of something else. So they both happen because of something. So go to the slide. Oh, for you. Yeah, no, no, that one. Okay. All right, so just so you can see on this, just so I, when I'm talking, you'll understand. So what the study used was they looked at the neuropathological common causes. So they use, for example, the micro, um, microcirculatory insufficiency, genetic factors, oxidative stress. And what they did was that's the main cause. And from that cause, hearing loss happened. And then from that cause, cognitive impairment happened. So this kind of takes us a step back with what we find in other ones that it's saying, hey, these are happening because of something else. They're not happening and causing this. Um, so it kind of sets us back a little with this. But it is something that you need to mention because ultimately there are other factors out there that do lead to things individually, so such as the hearing loss and cognitive impairment. Um, we aren't going to talk about that today. We're strictly just focusing on um, dementia and social isolation with, with just hearing loss in general. So I'm going to let Brittany take over for the next one. <laughs> All right, so the last two. Um, theories or hypotheses that um, we researched and, and wanted to discuss was um, cognitive load is the next one. So this is referring, <coughs> sorry, this is referring to um, effortful listening, um, which is simply just more effort uh, into auditory processing, uh, which can then lead to a diversion of other cognitive tasks, which can then lead to neurodegeneration or reallocation of brain function. So cognitive load is simply referring to the cognitive effort or amount of information processing required by an individual to complete a task. So the basic idea is if the task requires too much cognitive ability, the completion of that task will be hindered due to the limited cognitive capacity and working memory. So when we're talking about people with hearing impairment, cognitive load comes into play with the listening effort. The listening effort refers to the amount of concentration or attention required, by, uh, required for understanding speech. So we encounter this very often, but when patients have hearing loss, a lot of times you'll see them lean forward. They may turn their good ear towards you, 
close our eyes and wink, and that's simply to understand speech and language. So we're putting forth a lot more effort, energy, and cognitive resources to simply understand speech and language. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so once we're starting to put forth that more effort, um, we're also then taking away cognitive resources from other factors such as working memory. Um, so, and again, that effortful listening is just the amount of effort that we have to put towards listening, and again, the diversion of other cognitive tasks resulting in a cognitive reserve depletion. So, this image kind of helps explain that more. So, over here, we have our healthy uh, hearing individual. We have our six uh, cognitive resources, and in this model, uh, we can allocate three of them to auditory processing and three of them to other cognitive tasks, such as short-term memory. Uh, when we look at the same model, but we add the weight of hearing loss, we start to have effortful listening, which means we're diverting some of those cognitive resources simply to understand speech and language. And by doing that, we're taking away those resources from other cognitive tasks. When we have to do this on a daily basis to simply listen and understand our peers, coworkers, and family members, we can start to see long-term structural changes of the brain and neurodegeneration to occur. Um, which, you know, this will then affect other cognitive processes. So the, this is creating a cycle in which cognitive resources available to perform tasks are limited or reduced, and with regards to people with hearing impairment, um, resources are being diverted to auditory processing or speech understanding, and then are then being taken away from other processes such as short-term memory or working memory. And then this can potentially lead to an increased or accelerated cognitive decline. Um, in addition, one of the interesting studies we found, um, they used MRI brain scan, and they compared normal hearing individuals with hearing impaired individuals. And they found that hearing impaired individuals had an accelerated volume decrease in whole brain and right temporal lobe regions compared to normal hearing individuals. So this may suggest that there's an association between peripheral hearing loss and then brain atrophy. So if we apply the same model, um, but in this case, we're now adding Oh, sorry, I'm one slide behind, guys. Um, so in this case, we're adding uh, hearing aids to this whole equation. And by doing so, we can see a decrease in our effortful listening, which means we now no longer have to take some of these cognitive resources and move them over to auditory processing, but we can leave them alone to do what they're supposed to do. Um, so again, if this hypothesis is valid, um, which several studies have showed varying statistical significance, um, but the use of hearing aids um, may reduce the effort required for auditory processing, thereby preventing cognitive resources being taken away from other tasks, such as short-term memory, thus slowing the progression of brain atrophy. The last hypothesis we're going to discuss is the overdiagnosis hypothesis. Um, this is a little different and kind of comes at it at a different angle. Um, this is more focusing on the test selection um, and test performance for cognitive impairment. So one of the common um, tests used for cognitive impairment is the mini mental state uh, exam. Um, so this hypothesis brings to light the, the, the hearing loss and how it relates to cognition and diagnosis of cognitive impairment. So test selection for cognitive um, measures are usually verbally based um, and rely very heavily on the patient to understand um, speech and understand what they're supposed to do. Um, so these types of tests are not necessarily appropriate for somebody with hearing loss that does not wear hearing aids. Um, however, interesting, we found in studies to also say that even when the response mode for these tests are nonverbal, the instructions for the tests are verbal and can be complex and difficult for someone with hearing loss to understand. So this really calls to question appropriate test materials and their impact on test performance and diagnosis of cognitive impairment, dementia, or Alzheimer's. So this is actually the mini mental state examination. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but this is how you would assess someone's cognitive um, impairment. Uh, you are going to read these to the person and have them respond. So again, if you're talking about somebody with hearing loss, the question is, if the question is not heard or understood clearly, it's more difficult for them to respond correctly or properly. Um, so one study took cognitively healthy young adults uh, simulated a hearing loss, and then actually administered the mini mental state exam. And the results showed that reduced, audio, reduced audibility had a significant effect on the scores of the MMSE, um, which infers that um, audibility alone can affect, the, um, can affect the diagnosis of dementia. 
Um, and it has been reported that early signs of cognitive decline may potentially be overlooked as symptoms of hearing loss. So we really need a differential diagnosis. Is it hearing loss or is it cognitive impairment? Um, so looking ahead, uh, one of the studies suggested that central auditory processing testing, which is um, testing that audiologists will perform, uh, may be a preliminary test that could be administered during pre-symptomatic um, stages of Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, and since studies have shown that peripheral and central auditory system dysfunction do occur in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, um, again, saying that potentially auditory uh, processing screening in at-risk populations may be an effective way uh, to identify precursors to Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And again, that differential diagnosis. Um, so lastly, uh, and, and Jess is going to kind of jump in here real quick um, about social isolation, social isolation um, and how it relates to everything that we talked about today. Yeah, so you, you may have noticed that social isolation um, and depression were listed with all these theories discussed. So um, a lot of these studies have repeatedly showed that social isol isolation is arguably one of the biggest predictors of morbidity and mortality in older adults. So social isolation <coughs> relates to four outcomes through several different factors, and there's, there's two of them I want to hit on. So first one is health and behavioral pathways. Um, these are, are things such as adherence to medical treatment, um, smoking, diet, exercise. The other one is psychological pathways are impacted. Um, so this is their self-esteem, their self-efficacy, their sense of, of well-being, and their, their overall ability to cope. <laughs> and then just to add to that, um, so we kind of talked about this before, but when verbal communication fails for an individual with hearing loss, this can severely reduce that individual's social integration. So a lot of times we see voluntary isolation. Um, you know, your, your grandpa doesn't want to go to um, events because he can't hear and can't understand. So he's going to isolate himself. He's not going to go. He's not going to interact with people. So we see that social isolation. Um, reduced socialization has been known to occur along with social isolation, uh, sorry, apathy, loneliness, and depression. And research has shown that even a perceived social isolation is a risk factor for faster cognitive decline. Um, and that includes, um, you know, poor executive functioning, increased negativity, uh, depressive cognition, and overall poorer cognitive performance. Um, so thus is showing that social isolation and depression as a result of hearing loss may indirectly or directly cascade and lead to cognitive um, impairment or cognitive decline. Uh, so Jess has a little image here that she's going to review for you. Yeah, so just based off of what she, that last sentence when she said, how it cascades off of each other. So um, the, this one study we found, so it, it took hearing loss and, and it did show um, there was a link with the hearing loss for social isolation, which then that caused depression. So it was a, a direct link from hearing loss, social isolation to depression. Then we found one that hearing loss finds that link between hearing loss to social isolation itself and then hearing loss to poor cognition itself. What we didn't find was hearing loss was never directly in link with depression. But what we did also find was that little ring around here that social isolation can cause depression, depression can cause poor cognition, and so forth. It can kind of be a revolving circle that um, can be pretty detrimental. <clears throat> that vicious cycle that we were talking about. Um, so lastly, um, as we wrap up here, um, kind of the key takeaways and the general findings and kind of the things that you know we want you guys to think about. Um, so Richard, Researchers have found that elderly adults with hearing loss treated with hearing aids had similar rates of cognitive decline compared to adults with normal hearing sensitivity. So this suggests that hearing aid use may attenuate cognitive decline accelerated by hearing loss. Additionally, it was reported that hearing aid use is positively associated with episodic memory scores and showed that a decline in episodic memory scores was slower after the use and implementation of hearing aids. Um, we have found that hearing aids do boost self-efficacy, which can positively impact performance on cognitive tasks uh, or tests. We do know that low self-efficacy is associated with poor performance on a variety of tasks, may affect a person's overall feeling of self-worth, um, and again, lead to that social isolation. Um, and again, you know, we, we do know that that can lead to depression and again, lead to cognitive decline. So again, that vicious cycle. Um, Lastly, it was also reported that by maintaining strong social connections, we can prevent cognitive decline or prolong the onset of dementia. 
Um, so again, if people are voluntarily isolating themselves due to hearing loss and communication failure, um, can we not then say that by wearing hearing aids and being able to maintain strong social life and strong social connections, uh, that we can reduce the cognitive decline? So again, kind of just things to think about. And lastly, wrapping up our closing thoughts and food for thought. So again, as you probably are aware with research, you know, we are limited and have varying findings uh, revolving around hearing loss, cognitive decline, and the use of hearing aids. So the question then becomes for us, um, you know, how well is the hearing aid fit to compensate the hearing loss? How, how long, um, you know, what's the duration of hearing aid use? Are they, are they consistent wearers? Um, and also, how long after diagnosis of hearing loss did somebody decide to do something about it? So as we've mentioned before a couple of times, on average, it takes people seven years to do something about their hearing loss. So how quickly were these people you know, in the studies wearing their hearing aids? Um, and lastly, the flip side. So this kind of puts it the ball in, in, in the other court. So you know, what if hearing aids are not causing better cognition? but rather more cognitively able people are more likely to seek specialist help, such as an audiologist, and may seek hearing aid treatment more readily. So then this then becomes the responsibility of other healthcare professionals to really make that initial referral to see us as an audiologist uh, when people are complaining of hearing difficulties. Because as we know, um, the longer it takes to be diagnosed, the longer it takes to be treated, and we can see a lot of adverse effects from hearing loss um, resulting in cognitive decline. Um, that's all we have for you guys today. Um, so thank you for coming and listening to us. Um, we have time for questions if you guys have any questions. Yeah. <laughs> I know you discussed uh, mostly like dementia and elderly population. Mm -hmm. um, in your clinical practice or in your uh, review of the literature, did you see anything as far as um, like hearing loss in a child and its effect on um, like attention in school or things like learning disabilities, things like that. Because if it's affecting a cognitive population you know, on the, that end of the life spectrum, have you seen it in the pediatric population at all? So when it comes to pediatrics, um, again, you know, the key we have, um, so I don't know how familiar you guys are with newborn hearing screenings, but um, it is a state law um, that a newborn have their hearing tested before they leave the hospital. Um, if they do not pass in both ears at the same time, they are then referred to an audiologist to have additional testing. Uh, we have a, a three, three, six, nine model. So again, um, identified at three, fit by, or no, I'm going to mess that up. Identified by three, fit by six, and um, <laughs> it's <terrible>. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but anyway, so again, initial diagnosis of children is very fast, and we have to implement hearing aids immediately. So we have seen, especially in cochlear implant populations, um, if we implant children before the age of one, we actually see that they are on par with their um, similar age normal hearing peers. Um, so and again, even if we're not in a cochlear implant um, hearing loss range and we're just at hearing aids, we very closely monitor our pediatric patients. Jess and I are both um, pediatric audiologists. We primarily work with kiddos. Um, so again, you know, we're monitoring that hearing aid, uh, checking them every six months, making sure that they are hearing adequately. There are also um, other things in place. So as Jess mentioned, there are assistive listening devices for FM systems. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with FM systems. Um, there are probably some in this room, actually. Uh, so anytime a classroom is set up with an FM system, there are speakers um, so that that child, whether they decide to not sit in the front row and they sit in the back row, um, the teacher's voice is being presented to them as if it's right next to them. Um, so you know we do see that they are, for the most part, um, on par with their normal hearing peers. Um, that's not to say you know learning disabilities don't play a different role in that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah oh. thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. Is there a cognitive assessment you'd recommend for people with hearing loss? So that was one of the things that we looked at. So the mini mental state is one of the most common ones that are used. Um, the one study that we did read, um, they were saying that it is possible for that, the central auditory processing to assess, you know, is it peripheral or is it central? Um, so it's very interesting for us because if that's something that kind of comes into play, then that would actually uh, you know, include audiologists in the diagnosis of cognitive impairment to be able to differentiate differentiate the diagnosis between hearing impairment and, and cognitive decline. Um, but other than that, the other testings that we, we were able to find were all verbally based. And again, even the ones that weren't verbally based all had verbal directions. 
Um, and that's kind of where that, that came into play. Um, but the central auditory processing test, when it is performed, it's performed at a, a, an elevated volume, so we kind of take that out of the way. Yes. Um, with the one of the excuse me, um, hearing aids and you know devices that are used, um, especially with technology changing, how much did that improve like their vocalization of sound? Mm -hmm. uh, not only you know just our understanding, but like if I'm talking on the right, like do they like, yeah, surround sound kind of thing? Um, like is that improving or? It is so, um, and we'll tell you every year uh, hearing aid companies actually doing research with their current product. Um, so as we're talking now, the product that was just released by one um, company, Phonak, um, they're actually in process for their next device coming out. And what they commonly look for is the sound uh, localization. Um, so typically with hearing aids, um, different companies have their own algorithms. Um, two of the main ones kind of have this theory of what you look at is what it's going to amplify. Um, and that's where I kind of said the, the background noise, try and, try and eliminate it because, yes, there is no hearing in the world that will take the background noise completely down. And so everyone would have one on their ears. Um, but what it does do is it kind of hones in on who you're speaking with. And it depends on those environments that you're in. So if you are in a loud environment, it knows to take things behind you down, but it's still going to allow you to hear sounds next to you and in front of you. Um, it kind of, it, it acts as your, your natural ear, those behind the ear ones. It gets a little bit more complicated with those um, custom pieces that are in the ear. So our microphones on the, the bigger ones, so this guy, so the microphone's actually at the top. So when that's sitting on our ears, it's at the top. So it's directionally getting these sounds from front, back, or side, and behind us. These guys, these are actually just straight in your ear. So your microphones, right here, are just right here. So you're getting pretty much what's on your side of you. Um, I will say I try and curate people from these because of the limited vocalization you do get from them. Not saying you don't get any, but it's it's definitely completely different from, from this guy. I will say that. Yeah, with the, in the, just to add to that, with the in-the-ear hearing aids, um, you really are relying on the natural function of your pinup to funnel and collect sound, whereas the behind the ear hearing aids are, are really actually giving you a, like a leg up because you've got directional microphones. You have some that face forward and some that face backwards. And as Jess mentioned, we have what's called polar flops. Um, so the hearing aids are you know, very, very sophisticated. They are able to differentiate between speech, noise, speech in noise, music, um, and they're constantly making adjustments based on the environments you're in. So if you're in a noisy um, restaurant and you have somebody sitting across from you talking, those hearing aids are able to detect all that background noise and those backwards facing microphones are gonna close that down and lower it and then hone in on the person talking in front of you um, and just give you that much more benefit to um, understanding and then again localizing. Have you ever come across any research that would involve um, both hearing loss and tinnitus? Because I know tinnitus, you have like ringing in the ear, so that also can play in part with cognition. Did you ever run into any research with that? So, well, I'm say, we didn't really do a lot of research with tinnitus. Um, so, the theory behind tinnitus and, and what we've read and learned and, and have seen is. Um, so your brain, uh, when you have, a lot of times tinnitus comes along with hearing loss. Not saying that it is caused by hearing loss, but a lot of times we see it um, in so conjunction with, with hearing loss. And the theory is, is that um, once the brain realizes it's missing that sound naturally, it makes up its own sound, which is what we then perceive as tinnitus, which can be anything from a ringing, buzzing, clicking. I've had a patient tell me it sounds like bacon sizzling in a pan. Um, we do know that uh, some patients will have a benefit from wearing hearing aids simply because we're giving the brain back that sound that is missing naturally, and we can distract the brain from making that sound. Now again, that's not saying that it's, it's removing it, it's correcting it, it's taking it away. A lot of times when that patient takes those hearing aids out at night when they go to bed, that tinnitus is right back. Um, we do actually have a small population of patients that have a residual relief from their tinnitus, meaning when they take those hearing aids out, that tinnitus isn't immediately back. It'll take a little bit of time for the brain to be like, oh wait, I'm, I'm not hearing that again, and then bring that tinnitus back on. Um, but as far as cognition and, and everything, we haven't really, um, I, I haven't personally jumped into any research by that, but tinnitus in itself with hearing loss and hearing aids, we do work with a lot. Okay. 
Thank you guys very much. And on online viewers, uh, you'll get an email from me in a little bit. Take care.